सब्सक्राइब टू आवर यूट्यूब चैनल एंड प्रेस द बेल आइकन सो दैट यू नेवर मिस एनी वीडियो लेसन फ्रॉम राउज आई एस स्टडी सर्कल हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द डेली न्यूज सिंप्लीफाइड एन एनालिसिस ऑफ द हिंदी न्यूज पेपर फ्रॉम यू पी एस सी परसपेक्टिव टूडे विल बी डिस्कसिंग डेली एडिशन ऑफ द हिंदी न्यूज पेपर डेटेड फोर्थ मार्च टू थाउजेंड एंड ट्वेंटी वन एंड यू माइट ऑल बी नोइंग दैट द नोटिफिकेशन फॉर द सिविल सर्विस एग्जामिनेशन ऑफ टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन So do fill your form and the applications before the last date, that is twenty fourth March two thousand twenty one. And the articles that we'll be discussing today are displayed on your screen. So let us start our discussion. Now there are two important announcements for you. First is that the UPSC notification for the civil services examination of two thousand twenty one has been released today. And you might be knowing that the application process has already started. However, the last date for the receipt of applications is. 24th March 2021 so all those who are appearing for the prelims of 2021 fill their forms within the provided time limit by the UPSC also you should apply on the UPSC website as soon as possible to avoid the last minute rush for the various details and aspects and the official notification of the UPSC has been provided on the rouse is blog and you can apply for the exam on the UPSC online.nic.in Now in our weekly series of the mains question assignment from the daily news simplified videos the question for today's assignment is discuss the multi sectoral dimensions of malnutrition in india and the ways to address them and this question is for 15 marks and you have to write the answer within the word limit of 250 words further this question has been created based on the daily news simplified of 10th december 2020 so you may watch the discussion before writing your answer So in today's description you will find the link for this video and which has been provided on the e-learn platform of Rouse IS. You can write your answers in the comment section and all those who will send their answers by Saturday will get the evaluation and feedback from the Rouse IS teachers. Now this article on page number 7 is related to one of the important issues in Indian economy section. Now in this regard we need to understand that India had embraced the liberalization privatization and globalization reforms back in 1991 and after this reforms India had opened its economy for the international players as well and because of this opening of indian economy various foreign direct investments took place in india however when these foreign direct investments take place in india certain concerns are there regarding the taxation that is imposed on these multinational companies which are investing in india now what happens is that when a dispute arises between the indian government and the multinational companies these companies at times sue the indian government in the permanent arbitration court that is established at hague and these companies challenge indian government's tax imposition under the bilateral investment treaties that are signed by india with different other countries for example india had imposed retrospective taxation on vodafone and vodafone challenged this imposition of retrospective taxation at the permanent court of arbitration at hague and it challenged the indian government under the clauses of guarantee of fair and equitable treatment which were provided under the bilateral investment treaty between india and the netherlands so as a result of this challenge by vodafone against the indian government the permanent court of arbitration ruled that india's retrospective tax demand of rupees 22000 crore from vodafone was in breach of the guarantee of fair and equitable treatment which has been provided under the bit or the bilateral investment treaty between india and the netherlands similarly this court of arbitration has ruled that india has failed to uphold its obligation to the kane energy under a similar bilateral investment treaty that has been signed between india and the united kingdom and accordingly this court has ordered the government of india to pay kane energy approximately rupees 9000 crore from the total harm that was suffered by the kane energy because of adverse policies that were followed by the indian government so basically it is an issue related to the foreign direct investment by various multinational companies in india and in this regard india has signed various bilateral investment treaties with different countries from which india is getting this foreign direct investment Now what happens is that as and when the government of India imposes any kind of rule which is against the spirit of bilateral investment treaties these companies challenge such kind of policies of government of India at the permanent court of arbitration under these bilateral investment treaties Now you might all be knowing that in the DNS of 16th February 2021 we have discussed various aspects of the bilateral investment treaties that are signed by India with different other countries 
and you might also be knowing that India had unilaterally cancelled various bilateral investment treaties back in 2016 and 17. So do go through this DNS video to first understand what are bilateral investment treaties and what are the various clauses that are there in the bilateral investment treaties and why India cancelled these BITs in the first place. After that, you will also be knowing that India has recently formulated a model bilateral investment treaty. So do go through this video and try and understand the details of bilateral investment treaties first to understand the details of the discussion that is going to take place related to the FDI by the MNCs in India and the various issues associated with it. Now the tax controversies related to Vodafone and the Kane Energy are considered to be very important. It is because first is that it highlights the misuse of the loopholes in the tax laws by various multinational companies for example Vodafone etc. Secondly, it also shows the extent to which the government had gone to demand tax from Vodafone and Kane Energy through retrospective amendment to the taxation. And thirdly, you should note that the permanent court of arbitration had ruled in the favor of these MNCs like Vodafone and Kane Energy and it signals a kind of setback for India's retrospective taxation policies. And it further raises the possibility that there might be other cases that are going on at the permanent court of arbitration and the award of such cases might be adverse to the Indian government. Now both these cases of Vodafone and Kane Energy were related to the imposition of retrospective taxation by the government of India. So first let us understand what is this retrospective taxation. Now to understand the issue of retrospective taxation you should simply understand that for example government of India passes a taxation law in 2016. Now before this there were various multinational companies that were operating in India. That is before 2016 there were various MNCs that were operating. Now these companies were pursuing some kind of tax strategies and under such strategies they were not liable to pay the taxation to the government of India based on the laws that existed before 2016. Now if in 2019 the government of India finds that the tax strategy that was adopted by these MNCs was not fair, it brings out a rule based on this law that was passed in 2016 to impose taxation on the MNCs for their functions even before the law that was passed in 2016. That is, such companies or MNCs can be made liable to pay tax for a period even before the law related to that tax was passed. So it is a kind of retrospective imposition of tax liability on these MNCs even before the date of passage of such a law. And that is exactly the case where government of India imposed the retrospective taxation on Vodafone and Kane Energy and they were made liable to pay taxation under the India's new rules that were passed related to retrospective taxation in one of the budgets. However, these two companies challenged such kind of imposition of retrospective taxation at the permanent court of arbitration in Hague under the bilateral investment treaty. So in this regard, the author discusses that the introduction of retrospective amendment to taxation is well within the powers of the parliament. However, such amendments lead to greater uncertainty in the taxation and hence it discourages the foreign investment in India's. And accordingly, the government needs to be extra cautious before introducing such kind of sweeping amendments. So finally, the author concludes by saying that rather than challenging the arbitration awards against Vodafone and Kane Energy, the government of India should decide to amicably settle the issue based upon mutual understanding. So till now we have understood the issue that is going on between Indian government and the MNCs like Vodafone and Kane Energy related to retrospective taxation and the FDI by these companies into India. However, from UPSC perspective, the important things that we need to understand are the bilateral investment treaty and the model BIT that has been passed by the government of India. And that we have already discussed in the DNS of 16th February 2021. Then there is a concept known as base erosion and profit shifting and it is done through various tools like misusing the double taxation avoidance agreements, round tripping, treaty shopping and transfer mispricing. And accordingly, we will look at all these aspects for us from the general studies paper 3 point of view in the topic economic development. And some of the points that we discuss here are extremely important for us from the preliminary examination perspective. As you can see in the prelims of 2016, a question has already been asked related to the term base erosion and profit shifting. So let us understand these aspects from the prelims and the mains examination perspective. And first we will look at what is meant by 
base erosion and profit shifting. Now, as we have just learned that the government of India imposed retrospective taxation on Vodafone and Kane Energy. Now, why did India impose such kind of tax on these MNCs? It was imposed because India considered that such kind of MNCs or companies are taking undue advantage of the tax exemptions that are provided by the government of India in order to pay less tax to the government of India. And simply, such tax avoidance strategies wherein the companies take undue advantage of the tax exemptions in order to pay less tax is known as base erosion and profit shifting. Now, under such strategies, what happens is that these multinational companies shift their profits from high tax jurisdiction to low tax jurisdictions or tax havens. And as a result, what happens is that this leads to erosion of tax base of the high tax jurisdictions like India. It causes significant revenue losses for high tax jurisdictions like India also. Now, according to a report that was published by the OECD in 2017, it states that the BEPS or base erosion and profit shifting is responsible for tax losses of around $200 billion globally. And some of the tools that are used for base erosion and profit shifting are the misuse of double tax avoidance agreements, round tripping, treaty shopping and transfer mispricing. And if you look at this question that was asked in 2016, it reads the term base erosion and profit shifting is sometimes seen in the news in the context of. So clearly it is related to curbing of the tax evasion by multinational companies because it is one of the biggest concerns for countries in which these companies are investing. So after this, let us understand the tools that are deployed by these multinational companies for base erosion and profit shifting. First, let us understand the double taxation avoidance agreements and how they are misused by various multinational companies. Now, the double taxation avoidance agreements are simply tax treaties that are signed between two or more countries. And as the name of these treaties suggest, these are treaties under which the taxpayers in these two countries can avoid being taxed twice for the same income. And it applies in the cases where a taxpayer resides in one country and earns the income in another. So for example, Infosys is located in India or has its headquarters in India. That is, it is a resident company of India. Further, it has branches in United States of America and it earns from those branches as well. So it has both the resident income as well as the global income. Then for example, there is Microsoft which has its headquarters in United States of America and has branches in India. So it has its resident income in United States of America and has global income from the branches that exist in India. Now as such kind of multinational companies have headquarters in one country and have branches in other countries, there is a possibility that these multinational companies can be taxed in both these jurisdictions. For example, because the Microsoft has branches in India, it can be taxed in India as well based on the income it earns from Indian branches. And Infosys can be taxed in United States of America based on the income the Infosys earns from the branches it has in United States of America. So what happens is that these companies have to pay tax in both the countries where they have the headquarters as well as in the countries where their branches are operating. And this is known as double taxation that is prevalent on such kind of multinational companies. So in order to avoid these MNCs from being taxed doubly, the countries finalize a treaty known as double taxation avoidance agreement. And under these treaties, the payment of double taxes by the companies on the branches that are set up outside the resident country is avoided. And such treaties are intended to make a country an attractive investment destination by providing relief on dual taxation. Now such relief is provided by exempting income that is earned abroad from tax in the resident countries. And you might be knowing that India has signed the double taxation avoidance agreements with more than 80 countries. Now the issue here is not double taxation avoidance agreement, but the issue here is of misuse of these DTAA agreements. Let us understand how these agreements are misused by various multinational companies for tax avoidance or tax evasion. Now these double taxation avoidance agreements are misused by MNCs because India has signed certain DTAs with countries which are known as tax havens. And these countries are Mauritius, Switzerland, Singapore, Cayman Islands, Bermuda and Panama. 
Now the issue here is that such tax haven countries have nil or nominal tax rates and these countries do not share tax related information with other countries. And another issue with such tax haven countries is that they have a presence of large number of shell firms. And what these shell firms do is that they are legally registered in such tax haven countries. However, they do not have substantial presence in these countries or they do not have substantial operations in these tax haven countries. So although these firms are registered there, they do not have substantial operations there. And most of the activities of these firms are carried out through its subsidiaries that are based in other countries. So for example, if a company Y is registered in tax haven country, it might not be having substantial operations in such tax haven country. However, it is operating through various branches that it has created in countries like India. And the issue here is that under the provisions of the double taxation avoidance agreements, such companies would be liable to pay tax only in the tax haven country, even for the profit which it makes in India or other countries. And accordingly, as already, the tax haven countries are having nil or zero taxation. And accordingly, the MNCs misuse these kind of double taxation avoidance agreements in order to evade taxes. That is, they are already paying zero taxes in the tax haven countries by just registering in these countries. And also, they are not liable to pay the taxation in the companies in which they are having their subsidiaries. And this is because under the DTA, the companies are liable to pay tax only in the tax haven countries and not in India, where it is operating through its branches or the subsidiaries. Now, another term that is associated with the misuse of the double taxation avoidance agreements is the treaty shopping. Now, under treaty shopping, a foreign company routes its investment into India through a tax haven country. That is, it registers a company headquartered in the tax haven and then establishes its Indian subsidiaries to carry out the operations. For example, there are investors from the third country, for example, UK, Hong Kong or Germany. What they do is that they first register a shell company which is headquartered in the tax haven countries like Mauritius, Switzerland, Singapore, etc. And we already know that these tax haven countries have zero tax jurisdiction and also these share the tax information with other countries in a very limited format. And once a shell company that is headquartered in the tax haven is registered, these companies then start opening their branches or subsidiaries in India and they carry out their operations through these subsidiaries. Now, since these companies are based in the tax haven countries, they are liable to pay the tax to the tax haven country only where already the taxation is up to the level of zero and they can avoid paying taxes in India where their subsidiaries are functioning under the double taxation avoidance agreement. And this is how these companies get themselves involved in a kind of treaty shopping or misusing the treaty of double taxation avoidance agreement. And the third manner in which the double taxation avoidance agreements are misused is the round tripping. Let us understand that. Now under round tripping, what happens is that the capital from India is routed into the tax havens first and then back again it is routed back into India. And as the capital rotates round and round between the tax haven countries and back into India, it is known as round tripping. So simply under round tripping, capital that belongs to India goes out into the tax haven countries where it is used to set up a shell company. And the money is then reinvested back into India in the form of foreign direct investment. And the profit out of such kind of investments cannot be taxed in India because such kind of investments are being routed into India through the tax haven countries like Mauritius, Switzerland, etc. And these companies which are set up under the round tripping are not liable to pay their tax in India under the double taxation avoidance agreements. So simply the capital money from India goes out of India either legally or illegally. And by using such kind of money or capital, a firm or shell company is registered with headquarters in the tax haven countries like Cayman Islands or Mauritius. From there, these companies that are headquartered in the tax haven open their branches or subsidiaries back into India. That is, they reinvest this capital in the form of foreign direct investment into India. And as these companies have their headquarters in the tax haven, they are not liable to pay the tax in India under the DTAA. So these are the three tools through which the companies misuse these double tax avoidance agreements. 
and these are the reasons for base erosion or the erosion of tax base in countries like India and these companies use such kind of agreements for shifting profits from India into other countries. And the fourth manner in which the companies try to avoid paying taxes is through the concept known as transfer mispricing. Now transfer pricing simply refers to the price at which parent or subsidiary companies sells their good and services to another subsidiary companies. That is these two companies X and Y are correlated to each other. That is either they are subsidiaries or they have a parent subsidiary relationship. And the price at which these two companies transact or sell their goods and services is known as transfer price. However, under transfer mispricing, a subsidiary company, for example, X, which is located in the low tax jurisdiction or tax heaven, deliberately sells its goods and services at higher prices to another subsidiary company Y, which is located in high tax jurisdiction like India. Now, due to this, what happens is that it leads to higher operating cost of the subsidiary company Y that is operating in India and this company shows low profit in India. And as this company that is located in India shows low profits, it ends up reducing its tax liability in India. On the other hand, the company X, which is operating in low tax jurisdiction, shows higher profit on its balance sheet. However, as the tax rates are either nil or quite low in such countries, the company X would also end up paying lower tax there in the low tax jurisdiction. And that is how the companies misuse the concept of transfer mispricing to avoid paying the taxes. So in this discussion, we have seen some of the very important concepts known as the misuse of double taxation avoidance agreement, transfer mispricing, round tripping and treaty shopping. And all these are the tools that are exploited or misused by the multinational companies for avoiding taxation in India. And the common term that is used for such a process is base erosion and profit shifting. And this was particularly the case under which India was pursuing or imposing retrospective taxation on Vodafone and Kane Energy. However, when these companies went to the permanent court of arbitration at Hague, that permanent court of arbitration ruled against India. And the author says that rather than challenging the arbitration awards against Vodafone and Kane Energy, the government of India should decide to amicably settle the issue based upon mutual understanding. With this, let's take up the next news article now. Now, this article on page number five is related to a wildfire that has started in the Simlipal Biosphere Reserve that is located in the Indian state of Odisha. So various aspects related to this Simlipal Biosphere Reserve are very important for us from the prelims examination perspective under the topic environment and ecology. And we will be looking at these aspects from the prelims compass of environment and ecology that was released before the prelims examination of 2020. And a similar prelims compass for different subjects will be released before the prelims of 2021 very soon. So let us understand the importance of prelims compass and also let us look at the key aspects of the Simlipal Biosphere Reserve. So in the prelims compass of 2020, we have provided you with the description of different protected areas in India. And under this section, we have talked about the Man and Biosphere Reserve Program of the UNESCO. So it was launched back in 1971 and under this, the UNESCO recognizes a world network of biosphere reserves. And currently there are about 669 sites into it and there are many biosphere reserves from India which have been recognized under this world network of biosphere reserves by the UNESCO under its man and biosphere program. And last year UNESCO under its world network of biosphere reserves had recognized Kanchenjunga biosphere reserve. And accordingly various aspects of the Kanchenjunga biosphere reserve have already been discussed in the prelims compass. You can go through this and it is freely available on the e-learn platform of Rao's IAS. So you can see that it is one of the highest ecosystems in the world and it is located at the tri-junction of India in the state of Sikkim, bordering Nepal to the west and Tibet from China to the northwest. Further, it has also been recognized as India's first mixed world heritage site in 2016. Similarly, a list of biosphere reserves that are there in India have been provided and also it has been provided that which biosphere reserve have been listed under the Man and Biosphere Program of the UNESCO. So for example, when we talk about the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve, it is included in the Man and Biosphere list of UNESCO. And accordingly, various details of the location, flora, fauna and tribals have also been provided. 
So as far as the Simlipal Biosphere Reserve which is in news is concerned, it is included in the Man and Biosphere Program or the Man and Biosphere List of UNESCO. It is a part of the Mayurbhanj district in Odisha and the park derives its name from the abundance of semul or the red silk cotton trees that grow there. Also other kind of flora include the orchids, medicinal plants etc. And as far as the fauna is concerned, it has the presence of Asiatic elephant, gore, royal Bengal tiger, wild elephant, mugger crocodile etc. And the tribes that live in the Simlipal Biosphere Reserve are also important and these include the Renga Khariyas, the Mankidiyas, the Ho, Gonda and the Munda tribes. So these are few important facts for us from the preliminary examination perspective. Do go through the prelims compass and learn about all the other biosphere reserves that are present in India and that have been recognized under the Man and Biosphere program of the UNESCO. Now last year a new type of tiger was reported from the Simlipal Tiger Reserve or the Biosphere Reserve and this is known as the Melanistic Tiger. It is simply a rare gene pool on which black stripes are far more prominent than the Royal Bengal Tigers and are found only in Odisha. So this is a very important fact that the melanistic tigers are found only in the state of Odisha in India. Further in 1993, the presence of melanistic tigers was first reported in the Simlipal Tiger Reserve in Odisha. And then again, they were reported back in 2007. And now in the year 2020, these tigers were reported in the Nandan Kanan Wildlife Sanctuary in Odisha. So this is also an important piece of information for us from the prelims examination point of view as far as the Simlipal Biosphere Reserve and the Tiger Reserve is concerned. With this, let's take up the next news articles now. Now in today's newspaper, there are certain articles that have already been covered in previous DNS videos or in the Indian Express Explained videos. For example, this article on page number 7 is related to the issue of Brexit and its implications for India. And all these aspects have been discussed in the DNS of 3rd March, that is yesterday, by Pallavi Ma'am. Do go through this DNS and try and understand the important aspects of the recently finalized Brexit deal and also what are the likely implications for India from the finalization of this Brexit deal. Then there is this article on page number 7 that is related to the interest of the scientists in the planet Mars. And we have covered all these aspects in the third week of the Indian Express Explained in the month of February 2021. Do go through this video and try and understand the different aspects of the Mars planet and also why is everybody interested in Mars presently. And then there is an article on page number 9 which talks about the MSP for sugar. And this has also been covered in the Indian Express Explained in the third week of February 2021. So do go through this Indian Express Explained section and you will understand details of the sugarcane pricing policy in India, what is meant by fair and remunerative price regime and also what are the key aspects of the MSP that has been announced for sugar. With this we conclude today's discussion and this is the question for the day.